Good afternoon, everyone. My team continues to respond to the latest flooding event, and I appreciate those who work through the night to keep people safe. From our Swiftwater teams, to VTrans crews, local responders, and more. The good news is waters have been receding across the state. We'll now begin the process of assessing damage while we're cleaning up. And the cleanup part is critical. We'll need to take a look at the stormwater infrastructure like culverts and catch basins to get them cleared out as soon as possible. Because we, as we all know, uh, all too well uh, of recent uh, experience, this can happen again. So removing silt and vegetative uh, debris will be key over the next coming uh, days and weeks. Uh, so if we do get more intense rain, it has a place to go. Seeing homes and businesses surrounded by water once again has been heartbreaking. I feel for those who are just getting back on their feet after this summer's flooding and are now dealing with water in their homes and businesses again. I can't imagine the toll that has on anyone. But Vermonters are resilient and tough and have stepped up time and time again and will need you to help your neighbors once again. I'm calling on anyone who is able to reach out to those who might need a hand and help your communities. This storm also highlights the importance of the work we began after this summer's flooding. We simply cannot rebuild the same way in the exact same places as we have. Because as we've said, events like this will become more frequent, which is why the resiliency and mitigation work will be so important. Our team will continue to reach out to gather information, offer help, and plan the next steps. For municipalities who need immediate assistance, please reach out to the State Emergency Operations Center so we can coordinate and expedite any needed response. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Morrison for a situational update. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> As the Governor mentioned, in most parts of the state, floodwaters are receding. But Vermonters need to remain vigilant. Some rivers are still at flood stage, and most have extremely strong currents. Everyone is encouraged to stay clear of floodwaters. <clears throat> Thankfully, the state has received no reports of deaths or injuries resulting directly from the flood. We want to keep it that way. Please respect all road closures and never drive or walk through a flooded area. Should you be considering recreating in a river or stream in the cold of December, wait. <laughs> currents are, not that it was a good idea in the first place, but wait, because the currents are still too strong and debris and other pollutants are running downriver. Yesterday and overnight, our swift water teams made a total of 12 rescues. Three people, I reported to you yesterday that three people were rescued from a home in Jamaica, and there were nine separate rescues from vehicles caught in floodwaters. Our teams also assisted with some voluntary evacuations from residences that were threatened by, but not inundated by, water. Two Swiftwater rescue teams remain, remain staged, one in Colchester and one in Waterbury. We expect that these teams will demobilize this afternoon. The Emergency Operations Center is still activated. If towns find that they need additional assistance, they can contact the EOC through their emergency management director. We've begun the process of assessing damage to determine if the state qualifies for public infrastructure repair assistance. The team at the Emergency Operations Center will work with towns to collect and assess data in the coming days. Those returning to their flooded homes should be mindful of potential hazards. Turn off the power to your home if you can do so safely and have the system inspected by a licensed electrician. Ensure that your food is not spoiled and that your water is safe to drink. I'd like to ask you to visit the Vermont Department of Health website, healthvermont.gov forward slash flood for more health and safety information. Related to shelters, there's one warming center in the state currently, and it is at the Cavendish Baptist Church on Main Street in Cavendish. All other shelters have closed, 
as residents who used them have returned to their homes or made other arrangements. The Vermont Emergency Management website and social media channels will list other shelters or warming centers should they come online. And anyone needing housing assistance should call 211. We are working closely with 211 to capture damage to residences and businesses as a result of yesterday's flooding. I want to take a moment here to be very clear about how we are using 211 in the wake of this emergency. First, if you have a life safety emergency, please call 911. And if you have immediate needs for food or shelter, please call or text 211. If you do not need immediate assistance, but your home or business was damaged as a result of this flood, please go online to vermont211.org to report your damages when your situation is stable. Please use the online form to report damage. Only if you do not have access to the inter internet, you can make your damage report by calling 211 and speaking to an operator. The damage reports will be used to aggravate, aggravate, aggregate and quantify the damages to residences and businesses to determine if we may be eligible for any federal assistance in the wake of this event. At this time, we do not know if any communities or the state as a whole will qualify for federal assistance, but we want to make sure that we accurately tally up the damages. If you are already making repairs to your home or business, please take pictures, document the damages, save all receipts associated with the work you are doing to remediate the damages, and then report to 211. With that, I will turn things over to Secretary Curley from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Thank you, Commissioner Morrison. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, I'm sorry. Uh, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development has been doing outreach this morning to our regional partners to try to determine the impact of the flooding, both to our downtowns and within the business community. We're hearing that in many places, like in Lamoille County and in Montpelier, basements are once again flooded, but the damage is, has not risen to the level seen during the July event. That said, in areas like Waterbury, the Okemo Valley, and the Mad River Valley, the impacts of the high water mark of yesterday's flooding appear to be great. We know businesses that were impacted in July are again faced with cleaning up from yet another flooding event, and this time doing it while temperatures drop and more winter weather-like temperatures return. ACCD, through our Department of Housing and Community De Development, has also gotten word that impacts to mobile home parks are not necessarily as severe as the July storms. We're still gathering reports and awaiting some responses but from what we've heard so far, there is some damage to culverts and roads and bridges within the parks, but we have not had reports of significant damages to the homes themselves as of yet. Right now, the very best thing that Vermonters and business owners can do is to clean up what you can, and those who can volunteer their time, please do so in support of your local community. Much like the flooding in July, it is best to document everything you can. As Commissioner Morrison said, take pictures, make notes of any and all damage you encounter as you clean up. It will be important to have this documentation for your insurance company or in the event that the state receives a federal disaster declaration. All of us standing here today realize how devastating another flooding event is to what we are already vulnerable in our communities and businesses who suffered so greatly just a few months ago. ACCD will remain in contact with our regional partners and the business community to assess what recovery needs exist, and we will provide what support we can in the days ahead, working in conjunction with Vermont Emergency Management. And with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Boucher of the Agency of Education. Thank you, Secretary Curley. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by just noting um, yesterday's activities very briefly. So beginning around 8 a.m., uh, the Agency of Education's operations team started working very closely um, with our schools and ensuring that um, they had safe plans for students. I'd like to commend and um, really call out our, our schools, our school leaders. Um, I think it's um, a real testament to what a great education system we have. 120 total schools were closed early yesterday, um, so you could think of it as a mass early dismissal. Um, I'm quite convinced that our superintendents and our principals did not anticipate um, when they showed up for a regular Monday that they would then almost literally have to turn around and send kids home. And they all did it and got kids home safely, got them fed, um, and got them really to their communities and homes before uh, the, the, the roads were flooded. And I just really want to commend them for that work. So today, um, what we know is that six districts, and that's Harwood Union, Lamoille North, Mount Mansfield, uh, White River Valley, Orange Southwest, and Orleans Southwest are, were closed in full, are closed in full today, and that's a total of 54 schools. Many other schools reported a delayed opening today, and that's because they wanted time to uh, assess, uh, assess conditions this morning. The closures were largely due to um, needing to find alternative busing routes given road conditions as, um, as, an, as affected by uh, the rain event. To our knowledge, no one is anticipating closures beyond today, which is great news. Uh, so far, Moortown School has reported damage to its heating system and some classrooms, Moortown Elementary School to be more specific. Uh, their K through six students are going to Harwood Middle School and High School the remainder of this week, and uh, we're working on a plan um, for their pre-K students, and hopefully we'll have that finalized by the end of the day today as well. And Moortown Elementary is planning to reopen uh, that school by January 2nd, so hopefully we'll be, uh, students will be right back into their um, regular type of education experience when they return back from Chris, uh, winter break. One school in Bethel uh, has lost its softball field, and my understanding is this is a repeat, unfortunately, so they, they lost it as well in July, um, fixed it up, and now it's lost again, so that's um, disappointing. Um, AOE, our ops team, is working with schools and districts like Moortown to ensure that um, they're following any requisite steps, as Commissioner Morrison said, should there be um, a, a FEMA declaration. Um, we're just not sure about that right now. Thanks. Good afternoon, Julie Moore, Agency of Natural Resources, and I'm going to provide updates on uh, dam safety, water and wastewater concerns, waste management, river corridors, and a little bit of information about landslides. Um, so starting first with the Winooski flood control dams, members of ANR's dam safety team monitored these dams literally throughout the night and are continuing their efforts today. Um, as of noon, I can report that Wrightsville is 22 feet below the auxiliary spillway, and the, right, the rate of reservoir rise at this point has started to slow. Uh, Waterbury Reservoir, the rate of rise has also started to slow, and we are still eight feet below the action level for that facility. Uh, our current plan is to keep the gates closed on that dam um, for several days until high water levels recede in the Winooski River. And the Eastbury Reservoir facility is 15 feet below the auxiliary spillway, which is lower than what I had reported last night. Um, and we are pleased to see that decline. Uh, the dams do all continue to perform admirably under this second really significant test this year. In terms of other dams in Vermont, uh, our dam safety program is communicating with emergency managers for municipalities and contacting owners of high and significant hazard dams um, to request that they take a look and ascertain and report any damage. Um, our engineers are doing in-person visits to several dams today, including Curtis Pond in Callis and the Gale Meadows Project in Londonderry. This is a dam that had significant damage during July and was actively being rebuilt uh, as of last week. Also, we've had no reported issues at any of the hydroelectric dams um, from Green Mountain Power or Morrisville Water and Light. In terms of drinking water, the team is actively reaching out to public water supplies in areas with reported flood damage, but generally um, no issues have been reported. 
And as of 11 a.m. this morning, there were no state mandated do not drink or boil water notices or local advisories in place. Uh, we do have technical staff working with the towns of Woodstock, Fairfax, and Richmond, all, ex all of which experienced uh, very high flows into their drinking water systems to ascertain potential problem or damage. We've received reports from 15 wastewater plants across the state that experienced uh, flood-related concerns, including overflows of partially or untreated wastewater at pump stations, out of manholes, and at combined sewer overflows. Um, all of which have resolved with receding floodwaters and without uh, permanent damage or disruption of service. Two facilities in Waterbury and Richmond are still experiencing high flows, likely attributable to the high flows in the Winooski River, and specifically Richmond is reporting the river continues to back up into their plant. Uh, we've also spoken with the operators at the Johnson Wastewater Facility, which was so heavily affected during July. Uh, there is flooding in and around the plant. Um, however, the data that was collected this morning indicate that their effluent quality is unaffected. Our geology team has received a few reports of landslides, primarily along road corridors, and I expect Secretary Flynn may speak about those in more detail, um, but indicated rain on snow events tend to cause greater runoff and reduced infiltration, um, which means there is less concern about landslides on the partially frozen soils that exist currently. Uh, our waste management division continues to monitor, um, and as of 11 a.m. this morning, there have been no flood-related spills reported, um, but encourage any homeowners that have had water in basement that may have come in contact with fuel oil to call the ha HAZMAT hotline at 1-800-641-5000. Uh, for technical assistance about how to proceed with that potentially hazardous condition. And then finally, according to our Rivers program, uh, they're still very early, very early in their assessments and have reached out to local liaisons as well as conducting field visits to help craft a better picture. Um, but generally, this event was less destructive uh, from a river erosion standpoint than the floods we saw in July. That said, there are engineers on the ground working with the towns of Chester, Ludlow, Wardsboro, Brattleboro, Springfield, Stratford, Jamaica, Randolph, as well as several communities in the Mad River Valley and the Greater Mount Pillar area to address river-related concerns um, and damage that's been reported to town-owned town culverts. Um, we're going to continue these on-the-ground assessments over the next several days and also have technical ex experts who stand ready to as assist municipalities um, should f additional concerns arise. And with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Flynn. Thank you, Secretary Moore. <clears throat> Good afternoon. When we reported to you yesterday at 5 o'clock, we reported there were 15 full closures of Vermont State roads, not counting local. By 9 o'clock, that number had risen to 40 full state road closures. I'm pleased to report now <clears throat> that number is down to seven roads, still remain fully closed. They are US 7 in Milton at the dam. Vermont 116 in South Burlington, the city is doing a project on a troubled uh, drainage issue there now. <clears throat> Vermont 12 in Berlin from Riverton to Montpelier. US 302 from Barrytown to Orange. Vermont 109 from Cambridge to Waterville. Vermont 15 at the Wrong Way Bridge in Cambridge. And Route 14 at the junction of Route 15 in Hardwick. The three partial closures at this hour are Vermont 106 in Wethersfield at the junction of 131. I mentioned yesterday Vermont 108 at Spruce Peak Lodge in Stowe. That is a project being undertaken by the ski resort and by Stowe. <clears throat> we are keeping in touch with them. It's my understanding they are, they are attempting to have two-way traffic restored uh, for skiing this weekend while a permanent fix is planned after that at some point that they will announce. And the third partial closure at this hour is Route 14 in South Randolph. <clears throat> I'm pleased to also report there is no significant rail damage. You recall what you saw, especially like in Ludlow after the July event. All the repairs withstood this storm event. 
The Amtrak is back on schedule and departed both Burlington and St. Albans this morning. Cape Air has restored service to Rutland. The Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, as you might recall, heavily damaged in July, and we've been pushing to try to repair the final segment uh, with the possibility of having it ready for snowmobile season. <clears throat> there were four major sites remaining, and while they did have some slight damage, um, with an abundance of caution, I will say we are still tracking for uh, some potential good news in the month of January regarding that. There'll be more coming at a later date. There are no bridge issues on the state network other than the bridge on Route 7 <coughs> Milton, which is a result of the outflow from the dam. <coughs> VTrans is assisting the town of Fairfax today with some geotechnical service. And <coughs> the only slope failure that is problematic for us at this point, I reported yesterday, is Route 2 in St. Johnsbury. It's still closed. We had a slope failure in Wardsboro. Springfield, and, excuse me, and I believe Chester. And we've consulted with ANR as well on that. And uh, so we had a total of four on our network. And that concludes my comments, and I'll turn it back over to the governor. Thank you very much, Secretary Flynn. <clears throat> we'll now open up to questions. <clears throat> governor, obviously just going through this in July, I know it's still early, but from what you've seen, whether it's numbers and information, I guess, what are the odds or what's your best bet on do you think the damages will reach that threshold for a federal disaster declaration, I guess? It's, uh, it's very difficult to tell at this point. Um, it will be close if it does, um, but, um, but we'll just have to wait and see what the damages are, what they report, and then we'll go from there. A lot of standing water out there. Uh, it's going to be in the 20s tonight, I think. Is there is there a concern or a message about black ice or you know road conditions tonight? Um, I will let Secretary Flynn answer that. But uh, obviously, in those areas that were closed, uh, they're still with water still on the ground, uh, so to speak, and the roads still wet. Uh, they could be slippery, but I would imagine if the the water has cleared, that they will de-ice uh, that and put some some salt on. Is that pay for uh, uh, VTrans has been out through the night monitoring our roads and uh, is out again today. We'll continue to do that. Of the roads that I've reported that have opened since yesterday, some of them still have water right up to the white line, so they have to continue to be watched. Uh, and clearly we'll be uh, taking de-icing measures where we think it's necessary, but it's a great opportunity to just remind Vermonters that Black ice can fool you. you. You can't see it. You don't know you're on it until it's too late. So whether it's as a result of this event or any other time that you're traveling on the highway, especially around that freezing temperature, if the sun has been out during the day and its temperatures drop in the evening, it's just great to remind ourselves that you can be caught unprepared and taken by surprise. So black ice is a real threat year-round, well, year-round throughout the winter months. So we'll leave it there. Thank you. Governor, when you talk about federal declaration, uh, what are you looking at? Are you talking about what happened back in July with FEMA or something that's more limited than that? Um, it would be, you know, this would be another event uh, at this point in time, so there'd be a separate de declaration um, for this if we met the threshold. So that's what we're looking for at this point, just to assess the damages and see if it meets that, that level of uh, declaration. <clears throat> Eric, yeah, that's yeah. accurate. So for the July event, we actually got two declarations. We got the first one for the, I believe it was the 10th through the 21st, and then the second one was for the 3rd through the 5th. Uh, so each one hits certain milestones, so it uh, starts up a declaration uh, at the federal level, and that um, works through reimbursements at the town level. So at this one, we have to see if we hit those thresholds, so we're actively going out to towns now to collect that data. And Governor, after the July floods, you set up the program with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to help businesses because they didn't have assistance from FEMA. Are you contemplating reviving that program or expanding it? It's difficult to tell at this point. We'll have to see what the damages are. And then uh, the legislature will be back in session, so we'll be able to deal with them directly on this, this issue. Do you anticipate that lawmakers will be asked to 
provide some financial assistance to both residents who had a cap of what was it forty three thousand dollars from FEMA in businesses which got their grants from the state do you see a role for the legislature to play to help um, people there's always a role for the legislature to play um, I would caution everyone this is going to be a very very lean year in terms of our own budget uh, there isn't a lot of uh, there isn't any surplus left um, and there isn't any uh, federal funding coming our way that would help offset this at this point in time. So we'll, uh, we'll do whatever we can to help, um, but at this point in time, I just want to you know, level set and caution everyone uh, not to, to assume uh, that we'll be able to accommodate their, their financial loss. Governor, in your opening remarks, you, you stress that we, we can't continue to rebuild in the same place, in the same way. Certainly, like in Montpelier, Barrie, they've been trying to lift up uh, utilities above the floodplain, make it a little more re resilient. But, you know, not everybody's been able to do that. I'm thinking there's many homeowners in, in Barrie. Some of them took on floodwaters in their basement and, and had some of their utilities wrecked this, this time around. I mean, what, what options, you know, do... do people have especially this is the second flood in five months yeah <clears throat> well again um, Barry in particular uh, as you know uh, we have a plan we put forward approach the City Council about this uh, we're still working our way through that uh, in hopes of getting some sort of federal help for that project um, and we'll see what happens uh, from there obviously we'll, we'll be in contact with our federal delegation uh, and they'll be working hand in hand with us to to seek any opportunities to get reimbursement, mitigation money, and so forth. So um, we can, I'll, we'll confer with um, uh, Director Farnham, um, our flood recovery uh, disaster officer, and uh, he'll be probably at our press conference tomorrow or be uh, available at that point. So there may be other opportunities that I'm not aware of. Um, there's always buckets of money opening up, and we'll uh, we'll do whatever we can to help. What 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 progress? I guess have you seen in Congress? I know the House is on break right now. The Senate's dealing with um, immigration, I suppose. But, but have you seen any movement, or you know, any the needle moving on on that request at all this this year? I have not seen any. Uh, I think they have their hands full, uh, just taking care of day to day business and. Um, the good news in, is, in some respects, there is funding available through FEMA, or that is available to them, um, and needs to be distributed in a different way. So it would take a some sort of a notwithstanding uh, congressional act to to uh, distribute that money. But the good news is that it's been appropriated in that supplemental a few months ago. Was there any point last night where, as you assessed the damage that was going on, two big floods in five months, where you just scratched your head and said, what the heck is going on here? I, I don't think it's anything that we didn't expect in some res respects. Um, I've been saying all along, climate change is real. We're going to see more um, of these intense storms. Uh, the, the temperature fluctuates. With all the snow that we have on the ground over the last few weeks, I mean, think about the, all the Mondays we've had with this wet, heavy snow. A few degrees one way or the other uh, would have changed that into a rainstorm and more flooding at that point. So I don't know as we expected it to get as warm as it did. We, I don't know as we expected it to get as much water, rainwater, uh, as we did. Um, but, um, but I don't think anyone should be surprised about this. And kind of going off of that, after the July's floods, it was kind of talked about whether it's looking for housing or floodplains, how often maybe 10-year storms, 50-year floods, 100 years, does this qualify the storm under any of those amount of year floods? I, I don't think we can use the traditional methods of 100-year uh, uh, storms. We've proven with Irene and then the July flooding and then just five months later, another storm. So. Um, I don't even know how to, to qualify them at this point. Governor, I'm just wondering if you could give a little bit of insight into the decision to roll back the FEMA trailers. Um, we will be taking that up tomorrow. Um, we we'll have General Roy there in tomorrow um, to, uh, to explain what happened. It was a bit of a surprise to me. 
and um, but but it's not all bad news. I want to level set this. Um, there could be uh, some opportunity there as well, but we'll go over that tomorrow. Are you surprised though? Word was out Friday afternoon that FEMA was going to stop that project in Montpelier. I don't think you knew about it until Monday. I did not. How is that possible? Um, well, I mean, I, I do, I do know. I mean, they were talking about um, reassessing um, because they had pulled a lot of different levers, right? And I think General Roy will explain this uh, better than I can tomorrow. But um, they wanted to help us in any, any way possible, so they pulled pulled every lever they could possibly think of, whether it was the mobile um, mobile units coming in, or whether it was uh, available units they could rent, whether it was uh, housing that they could retrofit. Uh, anything, all of the above, uh, and they pulled the lever to, to make sure they house people. And uh, when it came, push came to shove, all of a sudden they figured out we have it somewhat covered already. So again, he'll explain that better than I can tomorrow, and uh, hopefully he makes some sense of it. They had a signed agreement with the city. Didn't yeah, well, the signed agreement is still in place. It's a signed agreement. So. I, the, the city will benefit from it, but again, I'll let okay. General Roy talk about it tomorrow. We've got a few folks on the phones, and then we'll come back to the room. We'll start with Keith, the Rutland Herald. Uh, no questions at this time, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. All right, we'll go to Emma Cotton, VT Digger. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. <clears throat> okay. Um, Governor, you said yesterday that you were a bit surprised by the extent of the flooding, and it sounds like, you know, superintendents and education officials were also surprised, I think, sent 120 schools home closed. I just wondered, um, was, was there information that you weren't getting about the extent of this what this one was going to look like, and is there more that the state could have done to prepare, given that it seemed to take a lot of folks by surprise? Yeah, I'm not sure that we could have done anything more to prepare. We'll learn something from this storm. Uh, I think there was a bit more rain than we thought there was going to be. Uh, the temperature was elevated more. Uh, the the uh, snow melt uh, was uh, intensified as a result, and uh, it just kept coming. And so um, couple that uh, with, you know, the elevated temperature uh, in the back roads that we have and the buses that have to travel on them and the roads breaking up like it was spring, um, we had mud conditions. So we were dealing with a lot of different things at the same time, uh, which impacted uh, the decisions of the schools, which, which I think made the appropriate decisions uh, because we didn't know what to expect next. And uh, again, the elevated um, elevated uh, levels of, uh, uh, of the streams, uh, the Winooski and the Moyle and the uh, Otter Creek and so forth, um, just across the state. It seemed like um, it was much broader geographically <clears throat> than, um, than maybe the storm in July, um, but not as intense, but, um, and not, we didn't suffer the damage, but much broader. You know, we saw you know, up in the Northeast Kingdom and Caledonia and Linden and so forth, uh, impacts there, some up in Franklin County, down in the, the traditional areas of, of July uh, in uh, Wyndham and Windsor and Washington County um, and Addison County as well. So it touched, um, maybe touched more people, uh, but it wasn't, again, as intense. Okay, thank you. I'm also wondering if you might be able to tell me if there are any processes that were put in place following the July storms that benefited the state or municipalities this time, um, given that it was so soon after the July floods. I, I can talk, and there's probably many instances, and maybe the team has other ideas, but um, uh, the one uh, area that I thought um, we did uh, took, took steps on early uh, was uh, the stormwater collection systems, the uh, catch basins and stormwater piping and debris uh, removal in the, uh, in the culverts and streams and, and bridges and so forth. Uh, we, uh, we focused on that intensely 
reached out to municipalities, asked them if they needed assistance with VAC trucks and so forth, which some of them did. So we got, um, we got the upper hand on that. I believe uh, had we not taken that action, uh, the, the damage would have been much more severe uh, because the stormwater would have had no place to go. And as we saw last night in some of the areas, whether it be Waterbury or Barry or Montpelier or Richmond or wherever, uh, the water in those uh, towns and villages receded quite quickly uh, once it stopped raining. And, um, and that was, I think, attributed uh, to the stormwater systems being able to, to relieve um, the, the flooding, which wasn't maybe the case in some of that in, uh, in July. Anybody else have anything you want to add? This is Anne. Um, hold hold yeah, on just a, just a second. I'm going to have uh, we'll answer the, the last question. I was just going to talk. I was just going to talk a little bit about the community response to uh, like some of the businesses and residents. So uh, knowing the storms were coming, for some of the folks who had built back um, since July and were able to move like HVAC systems up, um, they uh, and others that were not able to do it yet. Uh, local community efforts deployed and there was a lot of activity during the day yesterday <clears throat> where volunteers were helping folks move whether it was businesses moving inventory up or moving equipment up um, or homeowners helping get things out of their basements so um, obviously you know they still have to clean up the you know the mud or, or the mess in basements but it's uh, a lot easier than when there's a lot of stuff in those basements that can't you know that that becomes soggy or you you know very expensive equipment that that can't be replaced so i think that those were some lessons learned uh from july where you know people saw saw the rain coming kept coming and and just really got out and helped each other again this was both in businesses and residential was hearing stories all day long of this this happening so that was one other area that was sort of like an organic effort I, I might just add around dams and dam safety. So there are hundreds of dams in Vermont, um, the vast majority of which are owned by private landowners. Um, and we went to great lengths in the weeks immediately following the July floods to establish current contact information with every one of them um, and are able now to, to go back to that network that we've built, um, push out requests for information, and also make offers of technical assistance if folks uh, are observing damages or defects that they believe uh, warrant some sort of inspection. And so I think that that is a, a significant improvement and one that ultimately will be codifying as, as we move into a, a rulemaking process around high hazard and significant ha hazard dams. <laughs> just want to make sure we got everything for Emma and then we'll go to Ann. <clears throat> yes, Emma said, thank you very much. Um, thanks, can you hear me? We can. Um, just to follow up on that rulemaking process, I know that lawmakers have various bills aimed at um, mitigating future flood damage and uh, streamlining the emergency response and things like that. And I'm just wondering, what you think uh, the legislature can do to uh, make this kind of situation easier as in the future, and also if you have anything that you're thinking of um, that you'd like to see maybe in your budget for for flood response or mitigation? Yeah, we're still putting our budget together, obviously, and uh, as I said before, it's going to be a fairly lean year. Um, but um, but we're looking at buyouts uh, as well. Uh, so anything we can do in that regard and uh, making sure that when, when, people, when we're building, uh, that we're, we're doing it in the proper way uh, to mitigate, mitigate any future damage due to flooding. Um, okay. uh, in response to your question, one of the things that we will be advancing to the governor's office for consideration in this budget is to bring the urban search and rescue team into a proper existence and, and acknowledged as a unit of state government by bringing it into a general fund uh, stream 
we have been cobbling that team together, which as you can see from July and from yesterday's events, it is an absolutely crucial piece of keeping Vermonters safe in these disasters. Um, we've been cobbling it together for years with a variety of different federal grant streams and also uh, borrowing some funds from the HAZMAT team where the areas overlap, et cetera. Uh, and it's, it's really, I think it just, just really highlights the fact that we need to put that team on firm footing so that in future times when times are lean or other um, people in government perhaps don't remember the value of the team, that it is part of state government and our ability to respond to Vermonters, particularly our most vulnerable, because we know that people in the flood prone areas sometimes have fewer resources and ability to remove themselves from a dangerous situation. So that is something that we will be advancing to the governor's office and sure would love your support, boss. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things that we're looking to push forward is the Flood Resilient Communities Fund. It's been uh, funded in a couple different ways over a couple different years, but trying to formalize that in a process and put that into statute. It's a fund that can fill the gaps that FEMA doesn't fill. FEMA is very specific on its mitigation projects, and some things do not fit very nicely in that square peg in a round hole. So uh, we are backstopping with this FRCF, and we've been using that money uh, very quickly and very diligently, but we would like to uh, potentially keep that process going. But as my <clears throat> cabinet knows very well, this is going to be a very lean year. So any new initiatives will have to be offset with something that we're going to do without. All right, thanks. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor and your team, um, how difficult or easy was it for you to obtain information from the various EOC representatives from the municipalities around the state? Eric? So the Emergency Operations Center, uh, talking about building off the summer, we had relationships and we've had relationships over the last several years with the local EMDs. Each town has a EMD in statute, uh, so they are appointed or they are elected in their local municipality, whichever way they decide. But uh, that official then has direct connections to the Emergency Operations Center, as well as VEM uh, during Blue Sky events when they need training or they need resources, uh, they can reach out to us. So we've built those relationships over several years and we call on those during these events and those EMDs um, stand up and give us uh, a lot of resources both ways. We ask them a lot of questions, they ask us a lot of questions, they give us eyes and ears on the ground, and they will be the ones helping us decide uh, whether or not we hit those thresholds, and then we will work with them on resource needs. So we have a great relationship with the local EMDs. Do you get 100% participation on that? Uh, we don't get 100% participation because not every town uh, activates their local emergency operations center, uh, but we do have the EMDs participate in regional emergency management committees. Then those emergency management committees um, participate in other state level activities. So those EMDs uh, do participate, uh, but like everything else, they're volunteers. Uh, so they don't have the resources they need to do uh, the job uh, full time. And so we are looking to see what we can do in that capacity, but it is uh, like everything else, it's a short resource, uh, but they, they are doing well with what they have. Okay, thank you very much. No other questions. Governor, you uh, several times now in several of these press conferences, we've talked about the need for, for buyouts, for <clears throat> restoration of, of floodplains. Are there any specific areas geographically that flooded in June or uh, in July that also flooded this time around? Like some of these, like a real problem area that you'd yeah. like to see. Not <clears throat> I think uh, it doesn't take long to find some of those uh, areas that are prone to flooding. And I would say uh, throughout in this area, through Washington County, all the way from Barrie uh, into Richmond into Essex, uh, down uh, through on the Winooski, uh, the Lamoille, <clears throat> through uh, through Hardwick and uh, and Morrisville, and then into Johnson, uh, Cambridge, uh, problematic, um, but uh, but also the Otter Creek, and uh, and some of the uh, tributaries down through Windsor and Wyndham as well. So. There is a common theme here, and it's in those low-lying areas uh, with substantial volumes of water in those streams. What about 
What about dredging? Lots of people ask me, why are we not dredging? Why did we stop dredging? Because we used you to know, do that. Right? You know, dredging, um, and Secretary Moore can answer this probably more elegantly, um, but, um, but with my background in construction, um, it's, it's just not that easy to do. I mean, when you think about it, just the work itself, what, take away whether it's ecolog ecologically um, uh, suitable, just dredging, how do you get the material out? Where do you put it? Where do you dump it? What do you do? And do you get a machine down in and go right up through the river? What about bedrock? I mean, there's all kinds of things um, that, uh, that, are, that are problematic in terms of trying to dredge the streams to get any kind of uh, volume, increased volume. I mean, you, 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 if you go down two or three feet, that's not going to be enough. Going wider with a stepped approach, a tiered approach, uh, much easier to do. Still, you know, difficult in some respects, but much easier than dredging out a stream. Uh, when you're dealing with water, trying to dredge anything in water, you're 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 just fighting that the water and the and the different types of materials and so forth. So, just not that not as easy as it seems. Yeah, maybe a little bit. It's just just you know our river engineers are out assessing needs for localized dredging projects, generally around bridge abutments and culverts, places where material has been deposited and could actually present a real risk in the next flood. In general, as the governor's described though, we, we can't dig ourselves out of, of flooding. It, it, we just can't kind of create that capacity. And the other piece is oftentimes um, if dredging is done in one area, it really just pushes the problem further upstream or downstream. You, you create a place uh, where, where the, maybe the water is able to slow a little bit, but remains in the channel, and it will burst out at the other end in kind of a fire hose effect. And so um, the being thoughtful and trying to look for places to reconnect those floodplains is a far preferable solution uh, than, than dredging. Thank you all very much.